science, the art of learning about the natural world around us. It seems straightforward. You ask a question, you make a hypothesis about what you expect to find, then you perform an experiment to see if the hypothesis is correct, you analyse the data and determine if you were right. Simple, right? Well, not really. There is much more to it than that, which is what makes science so exciting and fun. In fact, scientists often describe it as a process that is all about exploring, asking questions, testing hypotheses and changing direction if their original ideas were wrong. All the while working and sharing with other scientists, advancing what we know about the world around us. My experience is that I'm almost always wrong that the original idea I came up with is that actually not a very good explanation for the way nature really works. Awesome, it's coral from an ancient atoll. Can you see? All the time you're collecting information, you're asking new questions. That's the key part of science. It's not just one question and the answer. It is one question leading to a bunch of other questions, leading to a bunch of other answers, which in turn eventually leads you to a much more full understanding of the process. So the real scientific process is not a simple linear one. This diagram shows the process can move in many different directions. There is often a constant adjustment of knowledge and of what the really interesting questions are. To show you an example of how science works, we are going out to sea with Dick Norris and his colleagues. Meet this group of Earth scientists who are fascinated by what can be learned about the climate history of our planet by studying layers of mud from the ocean's floor. They will drill down into the sediments and bring up segments of the sea floor in sections called cores. But first of all, why do they drill ocean sediments to study climate history? Climate history is recorded in little tiny craters that die and deposit their shells in the sediment. Unfortunately, on land, sediment is usually eroded, and it's only in the sea that we actually find very uh, well-preserved and continuous records of Earth history. The scientists join an expedition on the scientific drilling vessel Joydus Resolution, affectionately called the JR. They will spend two months in the waters southeast of Newfoundland, Canada. So what are they looking for? What's their quest? We know that we are releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. We know that carbon dioxide is a powerful greenhouse gas. We can measure the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere today. And we can measure the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere in the past. So the trillion dollar question is, what is climate sensitivity? And that is the question that we are seeking to address with our expedition. In other words, they are investigating how Earth's climate has responded to changes in atmospheric carbon dioxide in the past. Such research can help us understand changes we see today and better understand what may happen in the future. We go back in history here and look at a time where, the, where we know the climate was extremely warm. And we found a place where we have a, an archive in the ocean sediments that we can read and we can learn about the relationships between the oceans and the atmospheres, temperatures and chemistry. About 55 million years ago, during what is called the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum, or PETM for short, the Earth was a very warm place. Thermal maximum means just that. Temperatures were very high. No land ice, no sea ice. Then about 34 million years ago, the planet suddenly cooled into a glacial world, much more like the one we see today. We figured this out by looking at the evidence, hidden in the ocean floor sediments. The core I'm holding in my hand contains sediment that we recovered from the deep South Atlantic. And these sediments span the Paleocene, Eocene thermal maximum. And so the lower part of this core has carbonate-rich mud. This carbonate-rich mud contains the calcite shells of microscopic plankton. And then you can see a transition from this carbonate-rich sediment into a clay layer. And this clay layer is totally devoid of calcite shells. This is the period 
of ocean acidification and massive dissolution of seafloor carbonates. To collect sediments from the distant past, the scientists need a precision tool, or even better, a high-tech time machine. And this is exactly what the Joydus Resolution is equipped to provide. If you take the JR, the boat itself, and you add to it all the scientists and the technicians that are on board, you can think of the JR as a true time machine. As you drill down into the ocean bottom, you're drilling back in time. And you bring these cores up onto deck, and you have no idea what time period they came from. But it's the people on board the JR that tell us that story. If you come into the core lab and we're opening one of these cores where we think is around one of these really interesting time period where the world is changing, sometimes you open it up and you miss it. But other times you open it up and you see the world change before your very eyes. And, and that's super exciting. As different cores are analyzed, the new information gets combined with existing data to further unravel Earth's secrets. This is all part of this very exciting scientific process. As you see, these scientists don't work alone in isolated laboratories. They operate as a team. They discuss, debate, and they adapt their plans to get the most out of their investigations. It is a very dynamic, creative, and exciting process with a lot of human interaction. It's not like you're operating, you know, in a cubicle in an office someplace, you know, doing tax returns or something. This is everybody working together to, and constantly adjusting their thinking about how the world works in order to accomplish everybody's uh, research goals. Like many scientific endeavors, this expedition was full of surprises, twists and changes in the plot. In some cases, old ideas had to be abandoned and replaced by new ones as their understanding of Earth's climate history advanced. So we went out to sea with, with a set of data that suggested what we were going to recover when we drilled a hole in the bottom of the ocean. But drilling a hole in the bottom of the ocean is always a surprise because things are always different than you actually think they are. Um, and in this case, we had to revise essentially our drilling targets because we discovered that the subsurface geology wasn't actually what we thought it was at the beginning of the cruise. But we changed the strategy and it turned out it was very much more successful as a result. There's little white spots, look the at spots, that. But then the spots are below what we think of the boundary too, so this is pretty cool. So if you see right, right here, have this transition um, yeah. from dark clay to light clay. It doesn't look like much, but you know, oh, ask boy. Antarctica what what's going on, and it'll be you know, no ice and ice. And then, after two months at sea, the expedition is over. But the science continues, just in different settings and often with new collaborators. The scientists go back to their institutions to continue their research in even greater detail. They need to share their findings with other scientists around the world who will be critical and perhaps question their ideas. So sometimes it's two steps forward, one step back. Remember what Dick Norris told us earlier about being wrong. My experience is that I'm almost always wrong that the original idea I came up with is that actually not a very good explanation for the way nature really works. And in many respects, I think that that's the very best possible outcome. Because if it turned out I'd been right to begin with, I must not have asked a very interesting question. But because I'm wrong, and I'm discovering how I'm wrong, and then also what the you know, alternative explanations are, and eventually coming up with what I believe is the correct answer, it is just terrifically more exciting to be part of that kind of process. At important times along the way, the data and conclusions drawn from the data are written up by the lead scientists and submitted to be scrutinized by other experts in the scientific community. Only when it passes their review is the work published. From there, it can be used in a variety of ways. In science, one investigation is almost always part of a much larger story. The Newfoundland expedition is only the most recent of its kind and was focused on uncovering the climate history in the North Atlantic. Previous IODP expeditions, such as Wilkes Land, 
have investigated climate change in other parts of the ocean and published their findings for others to use and build on. Publications from the Newfoundland expedition will further expand what we know. And the more we learn, the more questions arise. This is the never-ending cycle of science. It's both exciting and challenging. And it's the way science really works.